Welcome to another episode of Hot Mess Espresso. Let's get into this week. This episode contains triggering subject matter about suicide. Your mental health does come first. So if this subject triggers you, please skip this episode. If you or someone you know and or love is struggling with suicidal thoughts or are in crisis, please call or text the crisis hotline 988. And for a complete list of resources pertaining to mental health, visit lisasugarman.com forward slash resources. You guys, we have an author, a nationally syndicated columnist, a survivor of suicide loss, and a mental health advocate. She's also a crisis counselor with the Trevor Project. Please welcome Lisa Sugarman. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Heather. Hey. So um, tell us a little bit about your journey and yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, glad, super glad to be here. We had such a great conversation the last time we, we talked. It's it, it's nice to be able to kind of jump back in and pick up where we left off. So I am here in Boston, just right outside of Boston. And I'm a mom. I have two grown daughters, uh, been married to the same guy for decades and decades at this point. Wow. I'm a writer. Yeah, I write, um, I write books. I write uh, a syndicated humor column. I write a lot of content in the mental health space. Uh, I was a parenting author for a really long time and I've kind of made a shift, kind of taken a hard right into the mental health space. And so most everything that I'm doing right now is just focused on stopping the stigma around suicide. Um, I lost my dad when I was 10 to what, what I was told was a heart attack, but ultimately 35 years later, I learned that it was a suicide. So that just, that just kind of shook me right down in my bones and yeah, it changed the course of my life. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, that was about 10 years ago when I was 45 that I found that out. So things have been a little different since then. And the work that I'm doing and kind of how I'm showing up in the world is very, very different than it was before I found that out. And I'm, you know, it's a bittersweet thing. It's, it's, it's an awful thing to learn, but if I can make some something positive out of it, which is what I'm really trying hard to do by doing so much advocacy work and crisis counseling work, then, then it'll be worth it. So that's kind of who I am and what I do. Yeah. I, and it seems like you're doing a fantastic job just from reading your, I guess, uh, resume of things you've accomplished. It's, <laughs> you've accomplished a lot in your life. Thank you. Thank you. But for people that don't know, what is the Trevor Project? So the Trevor Project is actually the largest LGBTQ crisis and support hotline in the world. It's really a, a U.S. and Mexico based service. It's a free service. If you know what the 988 crisis lifeline is, that's all around the country that you can pick up and call when you're in crisis. Think of it as a crisis lifeline where you can get support if you're feeling like harming yourself or someone else, or you're struggling, you would call that crisis line. Well, this is very specific to the LGBTQ community. So, and it's the largest of its kind. It's been around for 25 years. And I got involved. I've been on the lifelines now as a counselor on the phone line. So we have a texting service and we also have just the old fashioned, like pick up the phone and call someone. And I'm one of those people who answers the phone and speaks with people who are just having a tough time. And I've been doing it now for over a year. And it honestly has been a game changer for me as far as being able to connect with people kind of at that grassroots level, people who just need help, people who need someone to hold space, people who don't have support or who don't know where to find it. So it's an incredibly, incredibly impactful organization. It's so funny when I started training to become a counselor, which is, it's a pretty cumbersome process, but it's I'm so well worth it. And it's completely changed the way that I hold space for people. But when I first got involved with them, I had kind of like low key heard about them. And all of a sudden it was like everywhere I turned, I saw them, I saw people partnering with them. I was reading about them. So they've, they've really kind of exploded in the last handful of years and they're just, they're doing incredible work. Yeah. Yeah, they definitely are. And we'll have, um, well, I, I'll have everything linked below for how to get in touch with the Trevor Project and uh, where to go and who to call. We'll have all of, we'll have all of those resources for you guys. 
So mm, that's great. Oh, absolutely. It's it's an important resource that more people need to know about. And I'm pretty sure it's pretty well known, but you always have like a couple of people that are like, what is that? And, you know, so mm -hmm. whatever we can do to get it out, I would love to do. No, I appreciate that. Absolutely. So you are an author. What what inspired mm -hmm. you to start writing and, and books in particular? Well, I mean, I've always written. I've always done some kind of writing my whole life. I mean, going all the way back to like, you know, five, six years old with, you know, the cute little diary with the key, the little teeny key. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was just yep. kind of always, always filling them up and um, always writing. And I always thought from a really young age that it was super glamorous. I don't know where I got it from, but I always thought it was a super glamorous career to be a journalist, to write for a newspaper and to be in the paper. And I just loved words. I loved expressing myself that way. And I was doing it from such a young age that it just was something that stuck with me. And I mean, I, I've always journaled as kind of a personal practice every day mm -hmm. or as, as often as I can, but it was something that just felt supernatural. So I was an English major in college and kind of got involved in college with my college newspaper and was writing for them for, for several years while I was in school. And then by my senior year, I just had fallen head over heels for it. So I took over the paper, was the editor of my college paper. And maybe two minutes after I graduated from college, I was lucky enough to find a job at a newspaper chain here in, so I'm in, in Boston right. and that's where the newspaper chain was. And I just wrote my little guts out for, you know, for years and years. And, and then like, you know, there's, there's a pretty high burnout rate with journalists in general. Right. And so I just, I, sh I shifted around. I did like nonprofit work. I did uh, marketing and PR web development. I did, I just kind of found all these neat little pockets of places to, to write different stuff. And I, I just absolutely loved it. And then when my girls were born, so we have two, the two daughters that I have are 20, three and 26. And when they were like probably tweens, I just started stringing or contributing to my local paper and just kind of writing about parenting. It just kind of fell into it. It was on my mind. It was what I was doing. It was kind of the space I was in in the world. And I just wrote about it. And I had all these connections from when I was in college and out of college. And they'd always kind of hit me up to ask me if I wanted to, you know, write a feature or, contribute somehow. And so I did. And it just kind of took people liked what I had to say. And it was pretty relatable. And I kept doing it. And then it got branded into a column. And then it got picked up nationally. And that just kind of, that just kind of lit the fuse. And from there, I just got involved with writing books, which is something I'd always wanted to do, but never kind of like, you know, it's, it's kind of a pipe dream in a lot of ways. Like you think about how many people are out there writing manuscripts and how many people's manuscripts end up on shelves in bookstores. And it's a tiny number, like a really tiny number. And I just, I, you know, right place, right time with the right idea. And it was my columns that kind of put me on this, you know, this publisher's radar in California. And we've been working together ever since. That's amazing. So what, yeah, what's uh, both your favorite and what also was your most challenging book to write? I would have to say the most recent one. So that came out a few years ago, like right before we, we, fell into the pandemic and it's called how to raise perfectly imperfect kids and be okay with it. And I'd had the idea for a really long time and I'd written the entire book and I was super happy with it. It had just like gone into editorial. I was finally at that point where I could just kind of stop typing. It's in my editor's hands. Now they can kind of work their magic and we can, you know, we can get it on shelves. And I had this cool experience with somebody who I, I grew up with, who's a psychotherapist in my area. We just always used to talk, always used to talk about kids. She had three boys. I had two girls and, and everything she was doing in her therapy practice with her patients, they were all like the, the philosophy was the same as my philosophy. It was like this really humanistic way of raising kids, mm -hmm. like let them fall down, let them screw up. Um, don't worry about being perfect. And you know, all, all those things just really were aligned. And so we ended up, um, doing a speaking engagement together. I invited her to come and speak with me in Colorado and it was a blast and we had so much fun. And I realized how powerful it would be as a parent. I realized how powerful it would be to have kind of like the soccer mom's view, which is what I was kind of like, I'm the mom behind you in the pickup line. And Deb, her name is Deb Gansenberg. And she is the person who 
you know, has that clinical training. So we just kind of meshed. And I said, God, I wish I could put all this in the book, but it's too late. And my husband was like, why is it too late? Just call your publisher and see if you can just buy a little time and Deb can, and, and, you know, it's so simple. Like, you know, I love guys. Just call them. Yeah, just, It'll be just fine. Call them. It'll be just, fine. There's no such thing as deadlines and this, that, and the other thing. Right. Like, just, just give it a little more time. Right. Oh my God. Right. Right. Like it's, it's already on, it's on their production calendar, but whatever. We love and, the support. And no. I wish, right. Right. Well, I was shocked because when I pitched the idea to my publisher and I pitched it to my friend Deb, she was like, I've never written a book in my life, but she's, got so much knowledge and so much experience. And I said, look, I, I, there's no great science in, in what I personally do the way that I write. I write like I talk. So it's very conversational. And I said, do that, do that. You'll be great. I'll give you talking points, respond to each of the chapters that I'm writing with just tips and strategies and your feedback, like kind of from the therapist's couch Mm -hmm. and they publisher loved the idea. So we just, she busted her ass for four months and created all this great content to support what I was doing kind of in like sidebar style to everything that I was doing. And it just made it such a better book. So it was both the, the easiest and the hardest book that I've ever written. Yeah. I. But I was so glad. I was so glad in the end. Yeah. And I love that concept where it's like, I'm just doing my best as a parent, but here's somebody coming in clinically and either validating or tweaking or, and you don't kind of, especially on the validating and like, yes, you're doing a good job. Like, yes, we're all going to, you know, screw up our kids somehow, but you know, you're doing the, be- mm-hmm. you're doing the Guaranteed. least amount of traumatizing as possible mm-hmm. kind of thing. That's, right. Right. That's fantastic. And what, what was the book called again? It's called how to raise perfectly imperfect kids and be okay with it. And you can find that pretty much anywhere, right? Oh, you can find it anyway. It's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and in most bookstores. And you can go to my publisher, Familius dot com and yeah. get it there it's it's all over i mean we'll have we'll have all of your work linked but you know just that one that one's sticking out to me very much so yeah yeah no i i appreciate the plug of course so look we we love a good shameless plug over here <laughs> we you know, if you've <laughs> well, for it, that's good because i love a good shameless plug here <laughs> yeah so um obviously you've been through a lot uh you lost your dad to suicide mm. uh and it's, mm. I'm guessing it was a lot coming to terms with that 35 years later that it was not what you, what they said it was. Yeah, it was, I mean, it, can I say dick punch? Yeah, Is that yeah. okay? Is that going to get edited okay. out? Or, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of the, the Mac daddy of dick punches yeah. because yeah, I mean, that's the only way I can put it. Like, I was 10 years old. I'm an only child. So there were no other siblings. My dad was my person. He, mm-hmm. I was such a tomboy. And we were out there we were mountain climbing and playing, you know, catch in the yard and berry picking. And my dad used to race cars. So I would go with him. And I was like his, his little, you know, right-hand person. And so it was... Um, it was traumatizing. It was, it was upending in every possible way just to lose him. And then all of a sudden, and I had no reason to suspect that it was mental illness or depression or suicide. It was just nothing at all. That was not part of the whole picture story, history, nothing. My mom didn't know. None of us knew. And to find that out, you know, decades and decades later as a mom, as a wife, at the same exact age that my father was when he died was just, yeah, it was just shattering. Like there were so many things. Like I remember, I remember just, you know, so many things your, your brain is just popping it when you're finding something like that out that just rewrites everything. Yeah. Your brain is like a, it's like a, you know, a pot of popcorn Mm -hmm. or a bowl of popcorn that just is like firing in every direction. And, and you can't keep up with it. And so it took me a little while to connect with the fact that he was exactly the same age as I was when I found out. And it just, you know, it hits you in so many different ways. It still hits me. Like, I, I mean, I'm absolutely, I'm in therapy now. I, be, I went back into therapy. I didn't for a long time after I found out. I just needed to kind of sit with it and process it and kind of just let it be in my head and be how I needed to be about it. And then finally I felt about a year and a half ago that the best thing that I could do for myself, and it truly was, was to just go find someone who I could talk to and who I could just share this with and who was unbiased and not 
impacted by any of my history or trauma and could just listen and could just kind of guide me and pull things out and flesh things out with me. And it was just the best thing in the world that I've done. And I just lucked out. I have the best therapist in the world. So it's been transformative for me on so many levels. And yeah, I mean, you know, grief is cyclical. Everybody says it because it's cyclical and it's kind of always spiraling up, down, around. It hits you, you get grief attacks. You think you're okay. You're not okay. Um, you know, it continues to be a lot, but the farther I go into this world of mental health and wellness and well-being and suicide awareness and prevention, it's like I, you know, I fill up my own toolbox. I, I, I talk to people constantly every day who have gone through a similar type of loss. And maybe someone's doing something a little different than I'm doing, or maybe someone is trying a strategy that I never thought about trying before. And and so I'm always kind of picking up little nuggets here and there. And that's, it's, it's progress. It's just, it's progress and it's a process, but you know, I, I feel like I'm definitely ahead of where I was when I learned no, of, of, 10 years ago. Of course. I'm sure. Now, um, I, I know that you have said we should stop saying committed suicide. Why is mm. that? And I guess to piggyback off of that, what's, what's a better term that we can use? So the reason why kind of the mainstream mental health community is really urging people to change their language is because when you think about it, you think about the word, just take the word committed, right? When you, when you think of the word committed, what do we attach to it automatically? Committing a crime, committing a sin. Um, it's a negative, very, very negative connotation. Absolutely. And it's a very unfair thing when you kind of like drill down and you think about it. It's a really, really negative, I guess, cloud to put over that person. Mm -hmm. Maybe in, I mean, in my own opinion, I almost feel like it's a little bit disrespectful at this point to say that someone committed suicide as though it's this reprehensible criminal taboo bad thing like we're trying so hard to bust bust open this stigma of mental illness and suicide but yet we're using language that almost makes it criminal so instead of that when you kind of flip that that script and you say something like someone died by suicide or someone took their own life or someone ended their life that's a more appropriate kinder way of just saying it because then it's not accusatory right then it's it, it doesn't have that negativity attached to it and it took me a long time like it really took me a long time to kind of rewire my brain and now it's it's funny when i, I have such a visceral reaction to it now when i hear people because you know people not everybody knows it's, if it's not your wheelhouse it's not something you pay attention to it hasn't happened to you, you don't think about it and society's always said it that way so it's it's not all of a sudden going to be this great awakening it takes time but i have like a totally visceral reaction whenever i hear it and if i, I mean if, if it's someone i'm close to and i feel like i can kind of gently redirect and say hey so i am a survivor of suicide loss and you may not know that by saying it this way this is how it makes someone feel or this is the perception it gives so you can kind of like gently steer someone depending on who it is and right. how well you know them, but there are definitely other ways to say it. No, and that's incredibly important to know because I think earlier I I had used that term with your dad, so I apologize for that. But also, oh, that's okay. That's that okay. was something I didn't know, and I'm in I'm in the mental health world and all of that. So I that's mm. incredibly important to get that out there that we change the lingo on it because you're absolutely correct it is like a oh they they committed blah 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 and versus mm -hmm. they took their own life they ended their life and as painful as it is to ever say it out loud you have to in my opinion acknowledge the the pain and everything else of that person that took their life to drive them to that versus whatever their final act in this life was to like, I guess, cheapen it and make it, you know, criminal and not, like seem that way. So I'm really mm -hmm. appreciative that you've brought that to my attention just for the sheer fact that 
that is something that I can be more mindful of going forward. It's something that I can talk to people about going forward. And, you know, those little changes, we can change it overall. So I'm really mm-hmm. glad. And I appreciate that. I, I, I am too. And I really, really appreciate you asking the question because, you know, look, I, I didn't really know either until I was kind of firmly in this space and dealing with this on such a personal level. Like, look, we, we can't know everything, no. right? <laughs> we cannot. And ling, lingo, lingo and terms um, are so fluid in our world, especially in our society. And things are constantly changing. Like what was appropriate two years ago is not appropriate now and, and, and so on. And that just happens to be one of those things that's changed. And if you're not kind of in that space day to day, you won't know, but I, but I I love and appreciate the fact that you're so open to understanding why it would be a a powerful mind shift. And I know, I know it has been for me and for most people who I've had the chance to explain it to. So hopefully anybody who's listening can kind of take that in and see it from a different perspective. And that's all anybody I think can do. No, I think it, I think it humanizes Mm. the person. Yeah. It, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just, it humanizes them. It humanizes everything that they went through. Yeah, exactly. And at the end of the day, you know, we're talking about mental illness, right? So we're talking about this thing that is an illness, the fact that it relates to your, you know, your mental health and well-being is just kind of secondary. It's an illness like any other illness that might afflict anybody and put you in the hospital or require surgery or care or treatment. Like it's an illness and you need to treat it that way. And that is right. That's when we strip it away. That's how we're going to get to that point, that place collectively where it is no different. It's not perceived in a different way or treated in a different way than someone who just had a heart attack and, and died or someone who died of cancer, all those, you know, those other causes that we know, we don't even think twice about. Like you would never judge someone or attach a stigma to somebody who, you know, God forbid, dropped dead of a heart attack, but you would if someone took their life. And that's mm-hmm. the thing we need to change because an illness is an illness is an illness, right? Yep. I, I, I get very annoyed when I hear when, you know, even celebrities that took their own life, people are like, they had so much mm-hmm. going for them. That doesn't matter to people that are either nope. contemplating because like I've contemplated it and I've, you know, to be completely honest, I've attempted and mm-hmm. I had a lot going for me. I did. You don't see that. And I think we need to make it, I don't know how we can make that more obvious, but I don't know why when people take their own life, people like society as a whole goes immediately goes to, they had so much going for them. Mm -hmm. It's like, they, they because it's just, it's unfathomable. It it is. It it is. And until you've been there. Well, I think it's, it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it speaks to a, a bunch of different things. I think it, first of all, it speaks to the fact that so many people out there, not everybody, but a huge percentage of people who suffer from mental illness, whatever it may be, anxiety or depression or, um, you know, bipolar disorder, whatever it is, people can get really, really good at hiding it. Yep. <laughs> so you don't know. You don't, you don't know. They're not, they're not presenting in that way. You, if they're not talking about it, how, how are you going to know if, if they're not, somehow projecting it, you're not going to know. And that's, I think that's one of the big, big struggles. The way I want to go back to the question you asked, and I know it was kind of a rhetorical question. You were like, well, how, you know, how do we, how do we change that narrative? And and how, how do we affect people's mindset by doing exactly what you and I are doing right now? We do it everywhere. We do it every chance we get. And look what, you know, look what you just did, which I'm so, I'm so, appreciative of you saying, yeah, you know what? I thought about it. I tried to do it. It's that's how we normalize it. That's how we draw all that ugly power away from the stigma because that's, you know, it's that the mental illness has the same ugliness as the stigma does. The mental illness distorts things, changes things, makes things feel different, look different. And so does that stigma. And once we learn how to bypass that 
and, and get to just the fact that someone is struggling, someone is sick, someone needs help, someone needs treatment, someone needs to share, someone needs to be vulnerable. That's when this whole narrative changes and disappears. Well, and also I think that you know? not only do we like kind of... I'm trying to think of the word, but you know what you and I are doing where we're, we're open, we're vulnerable. But I also think that society mm -hmm. as a whole also needs to change their mentality on it, which I think is what you were saying. But also when you think about it, cause I, I get it. I get yeah. it a lot. I'm like, I'm not doing okay. And then you get a bunch of people that throw solutions at you. And I'm like, mm. I can't, I can't kombucha mix my way out of you know whatever has been handed to me basically you know there's not going to be a pill there's yeah. not going to be there might be a pill some people can take medication i was just about to say in fine. some cases actually there that is fantastic but that doesn't work for me um <laughs> ask me how i know yeah. but <laughs> and it doesn't work for a lot of people but like you know I, yeah. but then on the flip side you get people that are like you're being so negative all the time and it's i don't want to be I, I would love to not feel like this. Thank you for now making me feel like I can't come to you. And now I have to go hide. And I get that people mm. need to protect their mental health. But a lot of the times we just want to, we want to be there in air quotes for people, but we don't actually want to be there for people. Mm -hmm. We want to be there on a surface level. And the second think, that we start getting deep, people are like, no, I'm out. Well, I think that, I think, there are so many different reasons why I think a lot of, in a lot of cases, people don't know what the hell to do. Yeah. People don't know how to support other people. People just don't know. A lot of people don't even understand kind of the fundamental, the fundamental flow of holding space for someone. Literally. You let it flow into you, you take it in and it isn't even about, about responding. It isn't even about, finding solutions necessarily just i mean the statistics if you look at the statistics i know with trevor project we have a statistic that's that's really kind of more rooted in the lgbtq community and 40 percent of people who will try to take their life will be impacted by just one person who listens to them. So Absolutely. if you've got one person in your life, okay, if you're if you're struggling and you don't know where to turn and you have one person in your life who can support you or hold that space for you, that can be that change agent and reduce the risk of you taking your life or trying by 40%. I mean, it's one person. Yeah. And you look at what that impact is. That's a that's a pretty staggering impact. You know, and I think so, we need to humanize that there just, are also very ridiculous reasons for staying. I mean, m most of my, and I, I just want to clarify that I'm not in any kind of headspace where I'm going to, there's a plan or anything like that. So when I say my 20s, because I'm 31, like mm -hmm. there were bits and pieces in my 20s where I was at that like low point where I'm like, you know, I just, I don't want to be here anymore. And, you know, I never really actively thought about it. But also people would laugh at me, like not in a like, haha, you're stupid kind of way, but in a like, really, that's your reason. But I would literally, I stayed, I, I'm here and I didn't really like come up with a plan or anything like that in my 20s because of my cat Max, because he's kind of a handful and I knew nobody in my life could actually handle that little shit. <laughs> I was like, I can't well, do that. Well, but you know what? Him. I don't think that's crazy at all. I, I don't think that's crazy at all. Like, it's so subjective what people what people identify as their why yeah. for being here. And, and it might be a friend or a partner or a spouse or a goal or an animal or it could be, it could be anything. And as long as that thing keeps you in the right headspace and allows you to get the help that you need and allows you to kind of work through that period of being in crisis. Like who gives a shit what it exactly. is? If it's keeping you here, then, then that's a great thing. Yeah. So, so if you are listening and you are still here, 
because you spent the last five years getting your one like prize plant to flourish and you just can't stand <laughs> the thought of nobody knowing how to take care of your plant. That is a valid reason. And I am so glad you found that reason. Honest to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Now would be a good time to water your plant or pet your cat. But part two with Lisa Sugarman will be next week on Hot Mass Espresso. So stay tuned. Tis the season for warmth, laughter, and connection. This holiday season, join us at the Podcast Connection Network as we bring you the perfect gift. Get ready for a jolt of energy with season three of Hot Mess Espresso as Heather dives into candid conversations, brewing up real life stories, and serving up the perfect blend of chaos and insight. Embrace authenticity and growth with Connection Over Perfection, hosted by Amber. Explore the beauty of imperfection and meaningful connections with some new and some old friends. Unlock the secrets of the universe with the Everything is Connected podcast, hosted by Hunter. Dive deep into the thought-provoking ideas that'll leave you seeing the world in a whole new light. This holiday season, give yourself the gift of connection, insight, and endless inspiration. Tune into the Podcast Connection Network. Embark on a journey of discovery with our amazing hosts. Because in this season of giving, the greatest gift is the gift of connection. Start streaming now and unwrap the joy of a connected world.